Yat et al nutsro. Ada nanish lenegi e kia ani. Naiza dene bashes chin does a tenagene dashiche. Ada sont dene dashimel, quit ego de nanishne. Do tenacane de nasha. Nana Sam Slater dasha jene. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Sam Slater, and I'm a Navajo moccasin maker from Round Rock, Arizona. And this evening, I'll be sharing with you a little bit about Navajo moccasin making, um, sort of our, the history of Navajo moccasin making, and also, you know, kind of how we tell our history through moccasin making and moccasin wearing, and the life that we give to the art every time we practice it, every time we pick up an awl, and uh, every time, importantly, when we learn how to do it and teach others how to do it. So this is an art form I've been practicing for about four years now, um, since I, you know, came back home after growing up off the reservation. And this was the art that, that I would say really welcomed me home. They say the art has to choose you. And so that time trying to figure out, you know, a role for myself and my community, um, moccasin making really facilitated um, that, that process for me. And so while I say, you know, I really do love making moccasins, my, my even greater passion is teaching other Navajo people of all ages how to make their own moccasins. And it's just such a, you know, the learning communities we create are so beautiful. The experiences, I think, just give people so much power. Um, and so it's just really just something lovely to be a part of. Um, now, I began that teaching process when I was still a student at Danette College. Um, and, uh, you know, being approached by a school a little bit south of the college. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted me to work with their middle schoolers to create their own, uh, you know, their, their own uh, moccasins that the students themselves would wear, um, kind of as an alternative to, uh, you know, the school um, clothing program that the, that the tribe runs. And so we were thinking about how we wanted to do it, what materials. And so it was just sort of this conversation that I had first with the teacher and then you know, later once we were working with the students, thinking about what what do we want to use, why do we want to use it, um, and how are we going to use it. And so, of course, out of convenience, um, and excuse me, pardon me, the um, abundance of the material, the easiest thing to do is to um, work with one of the you know the supply stores off the reservation and work with cowhide. And so that's what we did. That's what I still do. Um, you know, I use cowhides, uh, I think it's called split chap suede, and then the white latigo uh, for the sole. And, you know, an artificial sinew and then using awls that are made from uh, from a screwdriver. Um, so, of course, you know, it's uh, sort of this process of uncovering that you go through trying to think through, well, how did, you know, my teacher, how did he do it when he was a kid? How did then his grand, you know, somebody from sort of around my grandfather, grandparents' age, then sort of going back, how did their grandparents do it? And sort of, you know, thinking about the evolution of these materials. Um, and so you're able to tell, you know, sort of the strong spiritual connection that exists between Navajos, moccasin making, and buffalo. So even though we haven't made buffalo hide moccasins in a few, you know, several hundred years, it's still an important recognition that that, that tells the history of our migration into this region. What were the animals that nourished us as we came and found our homeland here? And, you know, even for, you know, a few hundred years still had their home, you know, our, our homelands overlapped uh, here within our, our sacred, six sacred mountains. Um, and so that's important. It's also interesting because that's sort of where the archeological evidence will um, validate, although we don't need the validation, you know, just, but sort of the, the narratives intertwine at Promontory Point, Utah, where it's actually the oldest examples of um, quill work embroidery, um, you know, in the hemisphere are found there. And they were ancestral Navajo moccasins and they were all made out of buffalo hide. And the pattern is very unique. And it's sort of this connection point between Dene down here and the, or, you know, Dene, the Athabascans up north. Um, and it's sort of this this cool cross between you know they kind of look like ours they kind of look like theirs they're completely their own thing but entirely familiar to us entirely familiar in the way that you can see the evolution taking place you can see the stitching shifting and moving inside the leather um so that it was hidden you can see the the sole that you know was maybe one piece and then a, you know another coming around the side turn into 
one piece of sole leather that you know is like ours that comes up around the foot and still has that hugging effect that you know the um then I make um, and other interesting things like that, that sort of this evolution that's taking place and, and you know, um, asserts our presence here much, much earlier, you know, as long as we've known us to be here, uh, but sort of from the anthropological side who always love to say Navajos are late arrivers, late comers, never had an original idea of our own, when in fact this demonstrates that this sort of style of Southwestern moccasins that's common to Navajos, Havasupais, Hopis, Pueblos, um, you know, a lot of our neighboring tribes, um, that was our introduction into the region um, and likely introduced at that time with buffalo hide. So later it became more common to use, um, you know, deer hide for the upper portion and badger hide for the bottom, uh, you know, really thick, durable leather material for the sole. Um, and then we um, slowly, you know, there's this process where we were no longer tanning, you know, sort of there's a short period where, you know, a lot of Navajos were working with cowhide that they themselves slaughtered, butchered, and prepared, you know, tanned the hide um, from, from their own animals. And that then became replaced, I'd say, sort of in this long line relatively quickly uh, by, by that commercially tanned uh, leather that's available in stores off the reservation. Um, and when I teach moccasin making, um, we discuss the cultural, you know, teachings around it, the protocol, you know, how this came to us, whether, you know, whether it's representing our actual emergence into this world, you know, and actually telling the story of Navajo migrations through the symbolism of, of moccasins. Um, and you know how the soul represents the earth, the upper portion of the sky, the lightning, that's our stitching and, and sort of this moment that we are so blessed and lucky to give life to every time we put a pair of moccasins on and we continue that process. Um, or whether it's talking, you know, connected more specifically to other ceremonies and how they came um, to, uh, to be with us and sort of how the, the teachings and patterns of moccasin making came alongside that or it's connected to some of our holy people and ceremonies that they practiced and how they were adorned um, in order to engage in that. But I always emphasize, you know, you have to develop your own moccasin story. Um, you have to have your own narrative of the art. And that can include how you came to learn it, how it was passed down to you. It can include things like the fact that it maybe wasn't passed down to you. What were disruptions that took place in this natural learning environment within the home? Um, not things to be ashamed of, but things to acknowledge. A history that's definitely there, very tangible, you know, a recent memory for a lot of us. Um, and also things, you know, just, um, I remember one student so clearly describing her, her mother uh, bringing in the sheep every evening, wearing her moccasins. Um, beautiful moments like that. That's this narrative that gives life to those other stories, those other songs, that those other histories. And so you need both. You need to have a strong sense of yourself and your own moccasin making story in order to really get the fullest meaning possible out of the other narratives and stories and history and culture and songs that's passed down to you. Um, and so for me, I was thinking about that transition to cowhide and thinking about how Navajos, us Navajos have a, a really strong spiritual connection to sheep to their little friends, goats, and, you know, to horses. You know, you hear it all the, all the time, whether it's in, you know, songs and prayers and things, or um, just sort of our life ways are built around sheep and built around horses in a way that's not really familiar uh, to the way we interact with, with cattle. Um, and part of that, you know, you can say is that the, um, the Spanish conquest of this region, their colonization brought sheep and New Mexico and the territories around Navajo land, around our homeland, were sheep economies. Um, they weren't cattle economies for a very long time. Um, and so through our raiding, that's what we accumulated were sheep and we established those relationships and that kinship with, with sheep and with horses. And it wasn't in, really until the American colonization of the region that that cattle became more prominent and, you know, a more important part of the, um, the economy. 
And so, so that's sort of one side, but then I really thought, well, I wonder what, what was the first moment when my ancestors had access to cowhide and ship made that shift in their own experience to, to making their own moccasins out of that. And so in our family, one of our sort of clan ancestors is a, a woman named Asan Anele, who came from around Black Mesa due to her living, you know, in the fearing time and being born around 1845, 1850, um, you know, was um, somebody um, who was captured several times in her life because that was another huge part of the economy created by the Spanish in the region was slavery. And so she was, attempt, you know, enslaved three times um, and escaped each time only to ultimately be captured by the Americans and the U.S. cavalry. And so she was forced on the long walk. And what's interesting about our family's, um, you know, long walk story is that it doesn't actually include Fort Sumner. It ends before then. And it's uh, also interesting to note that while it's very common to think many Navajos don't have long walk stories in their family because of, um, you know, sort of internalized repression and, try, you know, sort of a Navajo way of experiencing history and experiencing trauma that sort of d doesn't foreground it. It's sort of, you know, said that's something that um, we uh, carry with us, but we move on from. We don't, we don't dwell on that. We don't return there. We don't go back. Um, and we only tell these stories when necessary, um, when in fact, you know, it was only about a third of the tribe that went to Fort Sumner, a third remained hidden in our homelands, um, and then a third was actually enslaved throughout um, New Mexico in Spanish homes. And so, so she never made it all the way to Fort Sumner. Instead, she was uh, taken to a fort or a camp, you know, on the other side, on the eastern side of, of the Rio Grande River. And that's where she was made the wife, that's how it said, of a Spanish soldier there. Um, and so that you can think about what that meant, what sort of consent was practiced. But because of that, that role um, that she was forced into, she was responsible then for um, the, um, you know, sort of the distribution of labor that took place in these camps that was forced upon Navajos. And sort of translating and, and trying to smooth that process. And one of the, those jobs that Navajos had to do coming through the camp and when they got to Fort Sumner um, was uh, was to butcher a cat, was you know butchering the animals that that would be distributed to them as rations, sort of whatever kind of starvation diet they were kept on, you know, and any access to fresh meat they had uh, that would have contributed to their rations. Um, and so that became important to me knowing that that was actually something she was responsible for and sort of this the newness that i could imagine many of these navajos experience working with cows for the first time butchering a cattle for the first time um learning how to cut that you know cut up that kind of an animal and then how to actually make use of the hide um make use of uh fitting this foreign material into our our navajo life ways in a way that felt organic to us. And especially for us who are working with, you know, commercial materials, excuse me, they, you know, coming from an industrial background somehow with really little to no care at all for lands, life, you know, the animal, um, sort of what are we to do with these materials in front of us when we're still trying to practice our Navajo life ways? and live in a Diné way, in a way that's legible to our ancestors. Um, and so, so this became a really important part, discussing with the students and thinking about that actual moment of contact, not, again, you know, not between Navajos and settlers, but the contact between us and this new animal, that we're now continuing the work of establishing a relationship with the animal, establishing, you know, they say, practice eh with your art practice kinship with it and not kinship in the way of, well, what am I going to call it? But can, you know, and, you know, kind of the cutesy way that we may want to think about it, but in terms of the responsibility that you have to the animal, to be respectful to the fact that this came from a, a living being, to be respectful to the fact that it was, you know, for us to be able to use it, you know, killed with a purpose for us to be able to use it. Um, and again, the responsibility that you have by taking on learning this art to embody it, you know, in your own life, make it a part of who you are 
and so much so that you have your own story and you have a way of sharing it and teaching it uh, to other people. And so I, you know, I kind of think of it as a way of, um, I don't know, I don't know if we could say it's, you know, redeeming any sort of redemption that's going on, but it's, it's smuggling kind of this life that this whole, you know, industrial process of getting the leather to us through these factories, through these feedlots, whatever, um, you know, that's, that's an afterthought there. But instead we're saying this material came to us through that questionable background. And instead we're making that the forefront, the life, the inna. That's the forefront of everything we're doing is a preservation of life. You know, sort of asserting the life of the animal and asserting our own life alongside that. Asserting our own um, teachings of what it means for Navajo arts to be about life. Um, and that's, you know, been a really important part of my practice, understanding that story. Because our, our moccasins are about survival. And I'll share one, you know, one story that relates to um, to Fort Sumner again is the fact that again Navajos were kept on the starvation diet while they were there, and there's stories of people boiling their moccasins, taking them apart and boiling them so that they could try to eat and get some nutrient or from the broth, you know, from their moccasins. Um, and so it's sort of this um, the care and the life that's been given to us from our moccasins, it's just a process of trying to shift and return it back to them and return it back to our community. So it has a, you know, a prominent place in our hogans and a prominent place in, in all of our lives. Whether or not you know, my students all go on to become moccasin makers, I know my goal is that they, they make it a part of who they are. That's sort of of utmost importance um, because that ensures that it, you know, it's a teaching that, that survives. So that's a little bit about who I am, my moccasin making story, and you know how it how it interacts and connects with with this historic site, a place of of great pain that you know I was instructed not to go back to, um, you know Fort Fort Sumner, and uh, outside of our our homeland. So thank you for joining me this evening, um, and be well. Continue to wear your mask and continue to social distance.